Um, awesome. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and officially start. Um, this is the Cloud Custodian uh, community meeting for Tuesday, March 1st. It is the 1st of March. Um, that March snuck up on me real fast. Um, just a reminder that we are recording this. So um, if you can't be on your best behavior, at least don't be on your worst or behavior that can get you fired from your job because we will post this on YouTube. Um, Otherwise known as we are also abiding by CNCF code of conduct. And that too. <laughs> Um, so at least be on, you know, that behavior. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post the meeting, a link to the meeting notes in the chat. Um, feel free to add stuff to the agenda. It is an open agenda. So there you go. Um, so yeah, you can go in there and follow along with me. Uh, oh, there's George. I will go ahead. George, do you want to take over or should I keep going? Uh, keep going because I might be pulled away at any time. Gotcha. I'll okay. dive in. I'll take okay. copious notes. Copious. Okay, I will do my best. Sorry, everyone. Okay. My furnace is uh, being repaired. I wish I was sharing. Hey, you got power. That's, that's improvement, right? <laughs> <laughs> um. Cool. Um, so yeah, so first up, um, we've got some workshops or webinars coming up this month, which is super exciting. Um, George and I will be hosting or facilitating those. So on the 8th, we've got our Cloud Custodian. Is that the 101? I, I think I need to double check. But between the 8th and the 9th, we've got a 101 and a workshop. Um, the 101 is going to cover um, essentially the anatomy of a cloud custodian policy, um, as well as your basic cloud custodian commands, um, and then demo how you would run that. Um, and then the workshop is an actual like hands-on webinar, so um, you will be following along at home. Um, and then one of, and we've done both of those before, so you might have attended those in the past. Um, but the 102 is a new one that's on the 16th. Um, and um, that in that one, we're going to be showing you how to use C7N org and C7N mailer. Um, C7N org enables you to run Cloud Custodian across multiple accounts. Um, and Mailer is what you use to make the notify action actually work. Um, so if you've done the 101, if you've done the workshop, if you're at the point where you're like, cool, Cloud Custodian is awesome. I want to do more with it. Um, this is the webinar for you. Um, so check out those links. Um, the webinars are free. You don't need to pay anything. Um, but it is helpful if you register. Um, so yeah. Um, check that out. Um, let's see. So, any questions about that? Cool. Um, make sure I'm keeping track of anybody raising their hand. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, this was a big conversation recently, but FYI, Python 3.6 is deprecated as of. January. So if you're on an older enterprise Linux, please check with your vendor, see what your options are. Oh, yeah. Kapil, what's up? Uh, I was just going to say uh, Python 3.6, the upstream from Python.org has been end of life for even longer than that. Uh, yeah. ended life last year. And if you're on an older enterprise distro, uh, one of the route, like there's lots of them, uh, then use Docker would <laughs> be our recommendation. Um, cause that way we can continue to focus on supported upstreams, um, and Docker is well supported on all the enterprise systems. Is there updated documentation on how to do that? 
um, yeah. how to use our Docker images. Uh, yeah. It's pretty straightforward. I'm, for I'm, ad I'm adding it to Docker. the notes. Okay. okay. I happened um, to be in there yesterday. <laughs> we can always okay. use more notes, uh, but generally speaking, for uh, uh, organizations that are raising Docker in some form or another, then our images are, are really just the existing CLI entry point. So uh, the rest is, uh, and we provide some documentation on mapping of our credentials, et cetera, uh, such that those run transparently. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Just want to make sure. George, are you going to put a link to those two in there? Yeah. I'm adding it. The only thing I want to add for the video, those of you watching, is on some enterprise Linux distros that have the older Python versions that you can't move, you might also have an older kernel that makes running Docker containers actually harder than it might be. Um, that's what uh, a RHEL 7 expert told me. Um, so I don't know if certain vendors offer newer kernels as backports or or whatever. Um, oh, so just we're gonna to... we're opening up the rabbit hole here, George. Um, yeah, I know. So... That's why I just wanted to. Okay, so call your vendor. <laughs> Rel does LVM thin for Docker instead of doing effectively a the overlay to that everyone else uses. Um, this is probably due to SE Linux issues, and uh, those were resolved in Rel eight. But outside of Rel, any other Linux enterprise distro. Um, is fine running a Docker image. Uh, even on seven, it's viable. There's just particularly gotchas that don't generally affect a custodian usage with regards to, we're not doing disk volumes in that context per se. So I, I don't know that it would be an issue there either um, outside of handling the standard rel semantics around SE Linux. But yes, there's a can of worms here, which is why we also defer you to your OS vendor. Yes, yes. Yes. So this actually came up in chat. That's why I wanted to bring it up, so. I, w I wonder if there's like a stick, yeah. It's something you could put somewhere, stick somewhere that's like, please consult your, speak with your vendor. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not yeah. aware of any of the other major enterprise Linux distros okay. that are using SE Linux. So it, this does feel real specific. Um, App Suze has App Armor optionally, um, or I think should by default. Uh, Ubuntu for some definition also does that and is generally fine. Um, the as, as we go more far afield, I, I would hesitate to comment without knowing what the specific scenario case is. But um, and as an organization, we are happy to help you with our software. We're not happy happy to help you debug your OS. <laughs> That's completely reasonable. Um, cool. Um, any questions on that besides that can of worms? Sweet. Moving on to the next. Um, so Cloud Custodian 9.15 is out, everyone. Hurrah. Um, check out those links for more info. Um, so, ooh, uh, this is merged now, so there's now lots of new resources to play with. It is highly alpha. Um, there's a missing part in the docs <laughs> which says that, um, it was in the PR, but yes, there, it I'll is tag that. highly yeah, alpha. I, I wanted, I wanted to note that because the release notes are just basically a list of all, all tacked at the end, have a list of all the resources you can play with. So I wanted to make sure to call that out. I'll I'll add uh, I'll add what you just said to the notes there. Super alpha. So... Oh, sorry. Go on. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say super alpha. So should we also? Does that mean encourage people to file issues? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. By all means. Yeah, we just started playing with the new APIs and hoping to file more issues when. They'd run into them, but AWS. Yeah, I think, I think there's probably going to be a whole categories of issues per se, yeah. um, and as you know, that's the nature of Alpha. Like there's some resources which don't do certain fetches. Um, actually, as a follow up to that, there is now the there's a draft PR for the CFN hook option on this for this provider as an execution mode. Um, 
I think I commented on last time, it's just a very weird environment where it's executing on service, the servers in the AWS CloudFormation account. Um, and we have to juggle multiple credentials into customer accounts as well as the provider side. And it's a bespoke packaging format that looks a little bit like Lambda if you squint, but it's very different. Um, Any, 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 if you have, if you try to check it out and you run into an issue, uh, feel free to, please feel free to file an issue. I might play with this. Fun. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks for the work on that. That's pretty exciting. Um, so shall we talk release cadence? That's what it says here. Yeah. So. I, I added that. Um, so we did this release and noticed we hadn't released in a while. And um, Kapil, Kapil and I were kind of having discussions like, hey, how come we don't do time-based releases? Or should we? Or should we automate them? And I was just wondering if anyone had any opinions about that or if that's something that is important to people to discuss. I mean, uh, definitely interested to hear feedback on what we should strive to. Historically, we have tried to do monthly, um, and sometimes it's fallen six weeks. Over this past holidays, it went to effectively three months. So we're we're, and now the question is, is um, we're working towards getting more people doing the releases. But there's also a question of, hey, do we just say let's just do a time-based automated release, unattended? It just happens, so to speak. Um, and that's on the basis of functional tests as well. Do people want to release more or less? <laughs> yeah, I, I was mostly just trying to fish for uh, feedback. If people, if you know, on-demand releases are fine, or if you're going on your own schedule anyway, or if people are just pulling from Git, or what, what people are into. This will probably be on the next Cloud Custodian Community Survey, but. If we don't have any info now, we can we can move on, Liz. Yeah, I mean, doesn't seem like any strong feelings either way. Um, cool. So, so I, I can speak more into it. Um, uh -huh. into it. Um, really, no preference. Uh, as long as uh, as we contribute back, because um, as Capil know, and we are in the process of migrating off of the old fork that we have a lot of custom code. As we contribute back. And we want to be able to have it merge and then release, um, and then we can then pull down the the latest release. So as long as uh, as the process is there, it doesn't matter if it's uh, on demand or or as a schedule interval. It doesn't really matter for us. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, you know, we could go to longer ones, but because we have such a constant pace of change, and the cloud providers are changing as well, uh, definitely. And, and yes, I have noticed. Yeah, several PRs in the last 24 hours as well. So um, much appreciated um, for the contribute contributions, and we can go through those as well in this meeting. Uh, but uh, in that context, uh, I didn't hear an expression on a preference, but like, would quarterly be too long? Like, you know, it's just too far from your contribution to see it back out there, or does it definitely does it quarterly matter? would be too long? For us. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Good feedback. Thanks. Well, too long for us during the, this this process of us contributing back, right? Right. Yeah. Once we're done with that, we don't expect. Uh, to... Is is monthly a reasonable cadence? Yes. Cool. And then we have two added agendas here. There's one from Darren yeah. and one from Mit Mitushi. I saw that. Am I pronouncing that right? I hope. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so we want to go ahead and take a look at this PR. Yeah, Liz, since you, uh, I don't know if I have um, uh, permission to present, but if you can maybe go to that PR. Yeah. Uh, this is a follow up question for Kapil. Um, um, we were talking about um, using the missing filter. Uh, I think uh, I understand what you meant now. So um, I, I looked through the code and I, I updated the uh, the PR and also provide the sample policy. So if you just just take maybe, yeah, take a look at the policy to see if this is what uh, you have in mind, uh, Kapil. So basically now we have a missing filter where it's check for hey do we ha have this remediation configuration? If not, then go ahead and 
set up the config manage rule with that remediation. Okay. I think that's what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. So great. if that's the case, I'll clean up the code and um, submit a proper PR. Cool. Cool. That's it. Sweet. Um, cool. And then what's added? Actually, Liz, can you scroll down just a few more lines? You want to go back? See the rest <laughs> of the policy. Well, I'll just scr uh, scroll down the rest of the policy. Cool. Looks good. Got it. Cool. Yeah. So basically, I'm using Anchor here too with YAML so that I don't have to you know, redefine the remediation setting. So. Uh, okay. Cool. We looked at that one. Um, and then, yeah, so we have a policy question. How do we want to do this, George? Uh, Matushi, you want to ask your question? Sure, yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is a pretty basic policy. Uh, so the ask is to stop an EC2 instance if the mandatory tags are missing. So I've created the policy, but I've used the event-based mode, and uh, I gave the event as run instance. But uh, the instance isn't stopping. Uh, so while I went through the uh, documents, it said that once the instance is in, it won't stop uh, if the instance is in pending state. You have to wait until the instance gets up and running. So I have given a filter to look to watch out for the instance state. Still, it doesn't stop. So um, as a workaround, I created a periodic policy. I marked uh, mark for all sorry. one day. When, when, uh, sorry to interrupt. When, when you said that you were looking at, you tried to do, um, you couldn't do things while it was pending. Uh, are, are you using CloudTrail or, or, and then try to wait for after it was running? Is that where you're trying to use um, the CloudTrail event or the EC2 uh, event flow uh, on uh, EC2 instance up? So uh, I'm using the CloudTrail event for run instance. I'm checking it at run instance. But I gave the instance running state as a filter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then you switched out to periodic as a workaround. So as a workaround, I use the periodic mode. Uh, so in the event-based policy, I'm marking that uh, instance for op, uh, marking it for op to stop it after one day. And as in the periodic one, I'm checking for that main state status tag. And if it check if it gets the main status tag, then it should stop. So I'm getting uh, the type error as can't compare offset naive and offset offset aware date time. So um, that would be useful to file as an issue. Uh, as terms of switch going back to your original mechanism of trying to do enforcement real time, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to necessarily go on the cloud trail event per se, what you really want to do is there's a separate, there's multiple event streams. Um, as part of the, if you look at the MU, I forgot, I think it's MU docs or execution mode docs on, for AWS, um, there's also a, a separate set of events just for EC2 mm -hmm. um, that are like EC2 instance pending, EC2 instance running, which are effectively real time on the um the underlying instance state at which point when you get it ready that the instance is running you can take any other actions on them the ec2 instance workflow itself and the api for creating an instance as you noted when you're in a pending state that workflow doesn't allow for certain other transitions but you can wait till an instance is in the exact state that you want to take the further action on um, by using that ec2 instance now keep in mind in that context you will potentially be affecting instances that are going from a stop state to a start, like someone stops an instance and then tries to turn it back on. Um, and so if there's an additional checks that you need to do in your policy to make sure that you're only uh, executing into your target set, um, those are useful, those are necessary as well. Yeah. Um, so just to be sure, you're suggesting not use the cloud trail mode and use the basic AWS uh, APIs for uh, the instance state. 
Uh, no, I'm, I'm referencing that custodian has support for multiple execution modes, uh, all of which are event based. Um, in the context of uh, in the context of this, the specific ones that I'm referencing are I'm just linking them here uh, is a separate execution mode called EC2 instance state, which you can use to execute whenever an EC2 instance has reached a particular state. You can focus on pending, stopped, you know, running in this context. Um, and therefore, you're not, the, the issue is that when you issue an EC2 run instance or start instance API call, um, if you listen on that in CloudTrail, it's asynchronous. So there are two different options here. One is is to use a different event that actually reflects a place that you could take those actions. There's a third, a second option, which uh, I don't recommend, but we have it because it's useful for this purpose, um, which is a, a there's effectively a, an ability to sleep um, and therefore try to let the Lambda get to the uh, control plane get to a steady state before the Lambda finishes policy execution. Um, yeah, I read about sleep, but haven't applied it. I could look at it. In, the, in this one, I would actually look at the EC2 instance state because that actually targets um, the instance being in the running state, but with the caveat that you'll be looking at uh, other instances beyond those that are done by create by by run instances, you'd also be looking at things that are turned on by start instances. Okay, yeah, this might be helpful. Uh, thanks. I'll look into this EC2 instance state. Um, okay, I have one more question. So, uh, initially... just just really quick. Um, just let me know either side. But would it be helpful to see the code for any of this? And if so. You could use paste bin. Do you mean the policies? Yeah. Yeah, is it possible yeah, to see the meant, policy? Yeah. Although, Kapil, it sounded like you got and you didn't need it for the last one, but maybe for this one. Or, or for other I, people following along. Yeah. All right. Um, but sorry, but please continue with the next question. OK. Uh, so uh, the policy, the ask is to compare uh, to check if the EC2 uh, resides within the subnet. So uh, what we figured out is we could compare the applic like there's a tag name application, which we are tagging the EC2 and the subnet. So we wanted to compare the tags and check if the application tag is the same for both EC2 and subnet. But there's a filter for this. Um, it was like net location. I forgot it was for this type of exact type of use case where you want to intersect security groups and subnets and application resource, they all maps the same. Um, try it, try, uh, I can't remember the name of the filter off the top of my head. Network location is the name of the filter for this purpose. Network location, let me note it down. Here's the, I'll drop the reference link in the docs. Okay. Yeah, because while I was going through the documentation, it said that currently it is out of scope of custodian to compare two different resources within a single policy. Uh, you can go one way hops. You can compare two resources. It's when you get to like two or three resources um, or you're like, so like we can do a security group or you can do a subnet filter on a uh, EC2, uh, the direct attribute match on the EC2, that's fair, but it allows you to go one way hops. Um, in some cases where there was a specialized need, like we implement, there's a separate filter that's dedicated to this purpose. In this particular use case, this was something that came up for, um, for an interested contributor and they implemented the functionality to do that tag intersection across multiple network attached resources from the resource to the network to, and as well as security groups. Okay. But as a generic question, you're accurate. And it just happens that in this particular case that you're looking for, that there was some things added specifically for it. Yeah, so in this example, it, it has mentioned comparing EC2 with security group. We can do the same for subnets as well, right? Correct. Subnets is part of that filter as well. 
Perfect. Uh, okay. So if time permits, I have one small question. This is also related to the tagging. Uh, shall I? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So um, after, so when we filter out non compliant resources like non compliant EC2 instance, I'm using the action to send the email to the resource owner. So uh, again, after referring the document, I understood that uh, there should be one tag named, uh, like I'm sending to resource hyphen owner, and there should be a default tag of. Uh, I think uh, owner, right? To send. Uh, I you mean, can customize what the owner tag is inside a mailer. Uh, when you when you're doing a mailer config, we, we don't we don't we expect there to be a notion that there is a tag that is maps to an owner, but what that map actually maps physically to is a configuration item. That you can configure and uh, again against your mailer config, but uh, I think it does assume a default of uh, resource owner. I forgot. I don't know if it has a hyphen in it or even an owner. I think it might be the underlying uh, actualized tag. Is that is that the question with regards to how do you customize which tag the owner comes from? Uh, so I saw how to customize it, how to customize the config in the mailer. I did that, but I, I just wanted to understand. In the documentation, it said that if we haven't customized it by default, there is a there should be a tag contact owner, uh, and if the contact owner exists, if we and in the action type, if we send the email to resource hyphen owner, then it will use the contact owner tag. But uh, I went, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I went inside the mailer config. I saw everything was fine. It was sufficing, suffixing the e uh, domain name as well but uh, apparently it's not sending the email so i was wondering if there is a way where i can just create a tag and then just append it with a string at the rate my company's name.com my company's domain name then i could use that tag to send the email but i couldn't find any example of that so you want to have a tag with a resource owner without the domain name uh i'm i'm i actually have a tag with the owner so i i'm getting while uh, creating a new instance i have created that auto tagging thing so i already have the there's something known as core id in my company and the email goes like this core id at the rate my company's name.com so what happens is i'm getting the core id so I wanted to find a way if I could append that tag with at the rate my company's domain, that would work for me. Sorry, uh, ta ta you want to append the tag with at the rate? Yeah, I want to add a string in the tag. Is it possible in the tags value? No, but if it's not inclusive, I mean, if you want to append the domain, you can do that um inside of the mailer config we also support ldap lookups if you're trying to map oids to or user ids to emails i checked all of them yeah uh, the mailer config and everything i looked through all of them i was trying to figure out why is it not sending emails to the so uh, for that case uh, i think the question is is have we looked at the mailer logs um and maybe that's a better chance this might be a better topic for gitter but the because I think this is, sounds like more interactive debugging per se. Um, and so in that context, the like if something's not working with the mailer, the right thing to do is look at the logs for the mailer and um, let's let's review that and sort of channel um, with regards to like it could be a network issue, like the, the, the myriad of issues for actual delivery could be trying to use SES and not having SES configured correctly. There there's uh, you know the the possibilities there as far as initial configuration setups for mailer are a little more varied so that's probably something to actually walk through with logs and, and uh, chat channel sure uh, i'll post my question over there on the gitter uh we have configured everything so if i explicitly uh, specify an email in 
the do section, it goes out. But this only this resource owner thing is not working. So that was a concern for me. But yeah, thank you for your response. I'll just post it uh, in the GitHub and would look out for their response. Cool. Yeah, uh, that's all from me. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah welcome to your first meeting. <laughs> And then in Gitter, there's a lot of brains there, and someone should be able to help you out. Um, but yeah, thanks for asking those questions. Um, I'm sure you also help some other people out here too, as well. Um, awesome, cool. Let's go on to the next. What do we have next? Like, hang on, I have like two screens open, and I lost the other one. <laughs> there we go. Um, Okay. Do, do, do. This is Pratush, I think. Yeah, I added one. There it is. Okay. Agenda. Um, 7109. I had a brief look uh, a few days ago. It generally looks good. Thank you. Uh, I've been super wanting to. I think I had an aborted branch on that myself, but uh, I'm happy to just take this one. Uh, sounds great. Um, I, I had a brief look like, a few days ago. It's on my backlog. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't really have any questions about it or concerns. Um, so. Awesome. Yep, I think that's it for me. There's, there's one more PR that I was looking into. I think there's a PR from Lucas. And um, there, there are some feedbacks that needs to be addressed, but I think he's missing. Um, I haven't seen him for a while. So I was thinking if I could do a separate PR for that. It's related to Lambda Edge on Lambda resources. Okay, so this is an older PR, do you know? Uh, uh, edge, let's see if Edge will find it. Okay, uh, yeah, 5999. Yep, yep. Okay. What is it, 5999? Yes. Uh, three nines. Five three nines. I can send a separate PR for this because I don't know if I can overwrite his code but yeah possibly not yeah. um i think there are minor things that needs to be added. yeah these are all minor i'm just going through it yeah. yeah uh is yeah uh however you want to do it okay. uh the, well uh, hmm. actually i just remembered something um is Lucas at your org? Yeah, he used uh, to be my org, but he moved on to a different place. So Okay. I, I just meant like still at the org as in assigning the CNCF CLI stuff. Um is is gonna want all the people that have commits in it to to do that. Um okay. and this PR predates when we have that in effect. Got it. Okay. So basically, as soon as you push this PR, it's going to start checking for um, the CLA and all the, all the committers on. OK, got it. Yep, I think that's it for me. Thanks. Cool. Um, and then we've got this one. Seven eleven nine. So, <laughs> and I, I meant to actually drop a comment on this this weekend, but the uh, the TLDR is like how AWS account work is different than how GCPA project, uh, projects work and how Azure subscriptions work. And GCP projects in Azure subscriptions were actually doing self discovery based on the credentials of the executing user to use the iteration APIs for projects and subscriptions. In AWS, account is a, a self-reflective resource. Basically, whatever uh, account the credential is coming from, we, we always have a singleton there that represents that account. And so in the context of using a, a C7 org accounts file, when you go to execute, account, it's a different type of resource than the, the ones in the other ones. And that is potentially 
reflective of doing an additional resource in both GCP and Azure to have a self project. Um, the other consideration is doing it against the discovery based projects and um, having appropriate filters there. There is a PR around doing config based with some additional more fine grained um, hierarchy than what is offered the, uh, then which lets you get a full subtree. The issue with the discovery API and GCP against the filters that are available, as you already noted, is effectively it's single level node. It's single node deep from whatever parent you pick. It doesn't actually recurse the subtree, um, which is problematic for lots of use cases. Um, so I understood that. Um, the, I think, I think the two options there uh, are going to be, hey, let's go ahead and merge some of the cloud asset inventory support for GCP projects that's been hanging out for a little bit, um, The which I think is probably the right thing since it's already got work in flight and it's got other fixes for source execution modes across different providers. So uh, it would be nice to get that in. And the alternative or other consideration would be having a self-reflective type of resource for, that's an analog to AWS account in both um, uh, GCP and, Ad, and Azure, where effectively what you do put in the config file will be exactly what you, uh, be, you would be executing against in that context. Now, the difference is, the difference is, yeah, that, that should do it. Um, yeah, I, I was just reflecting on the nature of credentials and the different clouds. Uh, I mean, GCP and Azure effectively are multi multi account, let's say, from an AWS perspective, whereas an AWS credential right. is a yeah. single account. But yeah. I, I don't think it would actually matter for the self-reflective nature in this context. So we'll just set the appropriate subscription ID, project ID, and uh, the rest of the APIs would, would work against that one. Yeah, yeah, because I think all the calls take the project ID um i mean all the calls all the calls i've worked with um you can scope it down to the project um so if you call whatever call and you pass the project id you know from the projects.yaml it should execute in that scope um so the one i'm struggling with uh Capel is you know trying to make this work with a um, query filter i'm not sure if it's something that used to work and stopped working but that filter is not working. Like for instance, again, goes off, pulls the full list from the projects and then only client side starts doing the filtering. Um, uh, is so it, is you it in, down, do you have an example in this policy? Yeah, this issue? Go to the you bottom. Down? Yeah, right, right to the bottom. Um, I think Liz is sharing, right? Yeah. Right at the bottom. So to pass a server side filter, you yeah. So that's client side filter. Um, if yeah. you want a server side filter, you have to use yeah. There's a there's a query column. Uh, is that yeah. Right. Uh, Kapel, let's just scroll down further. Yep. Uh, some more. Okay, there we go. So I did put a, a parent ID, you know, folder mm -hmm. ID. Um, mm -hmm. But what happens is it still calls, you know, first all the projects out, then on the client side, it's doing the filtering, which is not what I expected. So that implies your query, your server side filter isn't taking place. Yeah, and um, if I mess it up, like just put some bogus in there and I see the dump, it, it, it looks like the API call, you know, seems to be correctly structured, you know, the parameters. But um, the moment I put a real ID in there, I mean, there's only eight projects in there, but it returns first. You know, I, I kill it because needless to say, there are thousands of projects. So um, this one is super hurtful at the moment. <laughs> okay. I mean, I can take a look at this. There's going to be, I do want to um, caveat that when I dug deep onto the project filtering mechanism, it was. Uh, it, it was shallow as far as it only returned back immediate children oh. in that are directly in that parent. I see. Um, otherwise, if they were in subfolders, 
Yeah. They, they wouldn't get returned. That's why there's work that's been done on cloud asset inventory as a folder source, which supports actual hierarchy and, and nested sub, in the full subtree. Uh, okay. But yeah. the server side API that GCP exposes did not have that. But and if you're having issues with that, the, you know, that's relatively straightforward to look at. So, yeah. Yeah, if the server side faltering only going to give you direct ancestors, uh, sorry, direct descendants of that folder, it's going to have almost very limited use. Um, okay, so you say the cloud as the inventory would give us, yeah, would give the hierarchy. It gives the full hierarchy of a subtree. So when you do the parent, now you get yeah. everything underneath it, including nested subfolders. Whereas this on a server side filter was only one layer deep. Now. GCP has been known to change their APIs and deprecate things and add new <laughs> things. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, it's worth yeah. taking a look at that. I mean, the thing about this particular capability, you know, you can directly go into the GCP API Explorer and on the list, list projects API and just type in these same filters and parameters to, to see what you're going to get back directly from that interaction. Yeah. Okay. Um... But, yeah, the, the challenge is, and then is that the IAM credentials are in this in this API and the resource manager, um, and so the only way to get that out is through this. Um, I mean, understood. Yeah, I'm well, not sure if anybody else is trying to get IAM credits out. But <laughs> this is a real challenge. So you're trying to get. I, uh, you're trying to get the IAM policy out for the Yeah, like the primitives. I'm going to pull out all the owner and editor members of a project. Yep. And of course, those are very much of interest um, from a security perspective. Um, and to get that, yeah, we, you know, currently getting all those projects back, it, it, it eventually dies, right? Because yep. too many resources. Um, yeah, the CAI stuff should work if, and then the alternative is, is we add a new resource, which is actually relatively easy for us to do. It might even be less work than trying to get sure. the PR in to um, add some notion of a self reflective project um, in the context of GCCN org. I think the question to verify would be whether or not we set the project ID as we go through to execute, which I think we do. So, yeah. Okay. Um, no, that'd be awesome. And um, in some similar lines, um, do you know why parameters are not getting passed through when you do run script? Um, is that expected behavior? Uh, um, when you do run script, there's some quoting stuff you may have to do. So you may have to put the whole thing in quotes. Um, oh, uh, okay. If, you, if, that, if that becomes tedious, you can also just write a front end, a front end script to your script that you run with the run script. That's what I just did. I just wrapped it in another script. Um, Okay. Cool. Uh, but basically, if it's simple, like typically, it's just a question of the number of quotes. Like when you're doing additional parameters, like a lot of tools do dash dash to say additional parameters. Effectively, in this case, we're just doing the quoted string. So, um, if you can put the the whole command in quotes, that also would resolve. It's just it, it's nested shell script passed. It, it's nested parameter passing, um, and it's just which parser tries to interpret which command line. So. You be explicit. If you can explicitly just drop the whole thing you want to execute in quotes, then it'll just get straight past through. Okay, let me give that a shot. I haven't because I can see the, the the bars are right. You know, in terms of dumping, you know, the shell environment variables, but to get them to be passed on the command line to the G Cloud, because it mandatory to require it, it won't read the in var. Um, any case, you would see my tests in the Gitter chat. And then the one that's really hurting us is this uh, missing tags from uh, AWS. Um, it's in C7 org. Uh, so the bars and tags are missing from the resources files. So when you do reporting, you can pull out the account tags. The, that's the other issue there. Um, sorry. The I mean, so typically when you do the report, so the resource tag should be in the resource JSON, the account tag should still be in the account file. Yeah, so uh, right now- This is an org account file. Yeah, they're missing from the uh, resource.json, the- uh, What is missing? The the, the resource tags or the- uh, No, the account tags. So, so the like, account tags don't go in the resources JSON, they go 
in like they're, they're defined in the account file when you go to do a csmn org report you pass and, both and then what about the variables should they go through uh the variables get rendered to the policy that should be in the output directory for that execution so when you go to execute csmn org it basically creates like a separate account region or policy okay. name account region thing and then inside of I think metadata.json is the actual rendered policy with the variables interpolated. Okay, so let me ask maybe the question differently. If I want all the vars or tags, doesn't matter, in the um, accounts.yaml to be available in the resources so I can do reporting, what would be the best way to do that? You want them on each? Every resource, Jason. An example would be department ID, right? It's one of the account level tags. So mm -hmm. I want that in the report. Um, but of course, they only exist in the accounts at YAML file. Right. But like, I mean, when you do the report, you're ingesting them into something. Well, yeah, I'm and just that's wondering. Where you going to know that this org. is from a particular account? Like it, so, you, when I do when I do the C7.org uh, report command, uh, you know, I want to just reference um, those tags or vars um, in the report as additional columns. Uh, you know, usually you can only reference things in the resources, you know, to a JSON file. So, is there? The trick ah, okay, so copy when you them do over. report, you want to also be able to reference the accounts that YAML file content. Yeah, yeah, I wonder. Okay, that that's that's a fair, I think, and useful capability um, and worth a GitHub issue. Like when you're doing C7 org report, being able yeah. to do uh, fields from the accounts YAML configuration. That's, I think exactly. that that sounds totally good. Yeah, that'd be awesome because there's a lot of account level tagging that is very useful in reporting. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And I presume okay. whatever that capability would be available for GCP and Azure, I would imagine. Yeah, so I think the notion is, is that we, in addition to on report having like a, a tag, I guess for that was resource inclu inclusive of resource attributes, we'd have some sort of like account one as well that would then be annotated into um into the csv output okay so then yeah because one is providing that config file um in the run re in, in the report right and therefore we're now we're just specifying additional fields out of it yeah so okay it, it, i think it is pretty orthogonal to what we're doing and seems to be of utility in this use case Okay, that'd be awesome, Kabil. I mean, that that really. Please follow the up. issue. <laughs> that that will power up the reporting because those tags are, you know, things like cost centers and business departments and so on. Makes sense. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. No. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Love seeing that happen. Um. So yeah, we have been talking a lot in this meeting. Excellent meeting. Um, so taking a look at these open PRs here, does anything jump out at anyone? Is there anything we want to talk about here? Nope. Let's call it. We got a lot of good info out to everybody. No, we did. Yeah, all that right. Was really, that was actually really fun. Uh, by the way, this meeting is like open agenda. So if we want to keep doing this, absolutely 100%. So Yeah. OK. Um, I want to add something. Um, is there scheduled on the plan somewhere to have like a contributor workshop where you know if we want to contribute, what is you know some of the best practices where um you know how to set up the environment how to debug it how to add it 
um, instead of having to like start over from scratch, that I think be helpful because they are definitely things I've, I can definitely contribute, but of course, instead of spending hours figuring out the best way to do this, um, be really great to have that. Maybe AJ can lead it. <laughs> yeah, you are actually the second person to ask this. And um, I have been um, thinking about this and how we can do this. Um, so, um, and we also want to uh, address the um, contributor docs that we have right now. And in the process of doing that, figure out like how else can we support contributors and people who want to contribute so um stay tuned because we are thinking about that we just have to kind of um think about what that content would look like and how we could best like serve someone um but stay tuned it is on our radar yeah no that'd be really helpful um so more of us can help fix those issues <laughs> yeah yeah i've, no. I've, I've and, committed and, to a... oh go on george I was going to say, I've committed to a new contributor guide this quarter, yeah. next quarter if I'm slow. So I totally understand. I've just been wrestling with trying to figure out how to build the docs and how it all works yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. But absolutely 100%. You're right. Yep. Me, yeah. me and George have been scheming. We've been, we've been thinking about yeah. it. And like, it can be really intimidating too if you're trying to contribute to this thing that, you know, is so established too. You want to do it right. Um, and we want and to also just do it right. Reiterating that we are planning on doing a contributor sprint, um, uh, I think at PyCon this year, which is oh, at PyCon, okay. I think, I think it's April, is sometime in April. It's in Salt Lake City. I think at the end of April. I'm going to take an oh. item to find out when exactly that is because we should yeah, probably start letting it people out know. So we can sign up. Yeah, and that will definitely be a way to do a boot camp and get going. Okay, April. Yeah, that's excellent. PyCon. All right. Because you know, there's pieces there. I go like, okay, I can add something here, add something here, but I'm like, okay, there's more to this than just <laughs> hack it, yep. right? Like the tests um, and so on. You know, what what's what's minimum that's required and so on. Yep, yep, yep. That makes sense. That's a good. Yeah. Yeah. Stay tuned. We're thinking about it. I'll, I'll try to find out the PyCon information as soon as I can. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, folks? Oh, it's awesome. Uh, great, great meeting this week. Yeah. Um. Cool. Going once, going twice. <laughs> I'll call it. Uh, I'll call that meeting for Tuesday, March first. Go on out and have a great rest of your week. We'll see you next time. Thank Bye. you, folks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.